Today we're going to talk about the fractal nature of magnets. Now it's always been my contention that magnets are fractals because they have the property of self-similarity. Now basically what that means is that one magnet is self-similar to another magnet. Now we all know that if you take a magnet and break it in half, and when you break it in half from the north to the south, you get two magnets where each magnet has a north and a south pole and a dielectric inertial plane, okay, or dielectric plane, whatever you want to call it. Um, so if you break that magnet in half again, if you break these in half again, then you get four magnets, each with a north and south pole and a plane of inertia or a block wall whatever you want to call it. And that's an important feature of the magnet, so I don't want to discount it. Um, I want to make sure I point it out because there's something going on here. So every single magnet, every single magnet has a north pole and a south pole and a plane of inertia, which is exactly halfway between the north pole and the south pole. Okay, so, you know, Ken Wheeler likes to say there are no poles and that the poles are the inverse of counter space, and that's all fine. That's all fine. But basically, this picture, okay, so the other thing I want to point out is that around each magnet, around each magnet, you can draw the isopotential field diagram. So this diagram applies to, can be applied to, every single magnet, every single magnet, and it'll look almost exactly the same. So what I want to do, so that was my first clue that magnetism had something to do with the fractal nature of the universe because of this property of self-similarity that it seems to have. And that's why, you know, this is um, why our universe, why we find magnetism everywhere. We find magnetism everywhere. We find magnetic fields everywhere in the universe. And so this guy here, this drawing here, which in a previous silent video, I alluded to it being uh, a diagram of pressure mediation. And so I'm going to use that term. This is a pressure gradient. This is a pressure gradient. And um, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a few experiments um, where I measure the surface of the magnet. So I want to measure using the uh, Hall sensor and the voltmeter that was given to me by carry from the good vibrations channel i hope you check out his channel because he does he's the one that originally did this experiment and then he gave me um, a version of his um, homemade gauss meter and that's what i've been using to measure the magnet so we're going to measure the surface of magnets of various various different sizes and this is the key to the fractal paradigm is that we're not talking about different sizes of magnets, but we're talking about different scales of magnetism. So um, this is a magnet that I have. I have a lot of magnets. They're, almost all of my magnets are N42. They're neodymium N42s. And so this uh, magnet happens to be, I think it is one inch in diameter and one inch tall. And so um, what I did was I tried to measure the surface of this magnet. Um, that, I'm just going to go back there quickly because for every time I do an experiment, I show um, which pole. And that was green, so that's the south pole. And then I turn on my um, voltmeter and I try to measure the surface. And so you can see, I, I apologize, this is a little dark in this video. I tried to keep the lighting a little ambient so I didn't get any shadows, but this is a little dark, but it reads 1.43 at this point. And so what I'm trying to do is finding, I'm trying to find a maximum reading. So what I'm doing now is I'm going down and trying to find a minimum reading. I'm trying to find the dielectric inertial plane and the zero voltage reading, which I found. So I'm gonna go back and I think I failed to explain that. 
So at this point in the video, I am going to go down the right hand side. I'm going down the right hand side and I'm trying to find zero. So look here for a zero. And there's 0 0.04320. So I got the zero. So I'm going to come back up and now I'm going to try to find the maximum reading on the surface of the magnet. That is the south pole. And it's 1.43. I'm coming up. You can see the numbers getting smaller. And then as I go close, I get the 1.43 and then I get a 1.44. So the 1.44 I'm finding is the maximum reading. There it is right there. And I'm, I'm able to hold it there. And so uh, that is a real reading of 1.44. That is the maximum reading I can get on this particular magnet. Okay. So now I'm going to use a bigger magnet. So this is quite a bit bigger than the previous one. This is um, two inch by two inch by one inch neodymium magnet and it is N42 as well as most of my magnets, not all of them, I have some N52s as well. Um, but I want to make sure I'm comparing apples to apples and so here we've got another N42. It's much bigger. So let's watch and see what happens here. So I'm going away. And again, I apologize that this is dark. Hopefully you can see the numbers, but I'll tell you it's 1.43, 1.44. So I was able to find 1.44 fairly quickly, right in the middle there. A little off to the, not quite in the middle, but really it's, tr I have to get very close to the surface to get this 1.44 reading. And so I'm able to get that pretty consistently on this magnet. And so that is, I didn't try to find the zero point dielectric plane on this video, but um, it is there for sure, 1.44. So that is the big magnet. So now I'm gonna to switch to a much smaller magnets. Now these magnets are five millimeters in diameter, if I remember correctly. And so let's have a look at what happens here. That's the south pole. So I'm always using the south pole and I'm always trying to use the same side, the same face of the Hall sensor to make sure I'm comparing apples to, to apples. And because if I tested the north pole, I would get a different reading. And if I tested, if I flipped the Hall sensor right here, I would also get a different reading. And so now I, I was able to get the 1.44 right away. Let's watch that again. I was able to get the 1.44 right away once I make my measurement, 1.44. So actually it was interesting, the smaller magnet, I was able to find the 1.44 mark much easier. So now I'm going to try a super small, this is a very small magnet, okay? This magnet I have in my hand here, it is also five millimeters, but it is it is flat. It's a lot flatter than the, the spherical magnets from the previous uh, experiment. It is it has a little hoop here, which is on the south pole, and it's hanging from a string. So just my fingers are there to give you a size of scale. It is not very big, but uh, you will see that, um, let me move this out of the way. All right, I just want you to see that this is the North Pole and not the South Pole. Okay, that's the North Pole. So what I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to use the other side of the Hall sensor. So I'm gonna have to use the opposite side. So I think I show here, um, yeah, so that's the wrong side because I only get a 1.38. And when I turn it around, now I'm gonna turn it around and now I can get the 1.43. And now I'm trying, I'm gonna try really hard here to get the 1.44 reading. It's very difficult um, because this magnet is so small, it's hard to find the, the sweet spot on the Hall sensor that gets the reading. Now, now I'm trying to actually find the zero point on that tiny magnet. I've got 0.2, 0. 0. I can, I'm trying to find the dielectric inertial plane of this tiny magnet. And it's really hard to do, as you can see. So I've got 
0 0.3, 0 0.1, uh, 2, 4, 1, 0, 0 0.10, 0 0.03, oh, I saw 0. I saw 0 right there, 0 0.00. So I was able to find the 0 point. Let's see if I can pause the video and find that exactly, that exact point. Somewhere in there. So 0.01. Anyways, there was a zero in there, but it's very hard to find because it's a very tiny magnet. And so I go back. I'm still trying to find the 1.44, the maximum reading that I've ever been able to do on these magnets. And I am going to, spoiler alert, take you to the end of this video because it does take me quite a while. That here, I, At the end here, I think I find it. Uh, 1.43, 1.44. There, I saw it. Let's see if I can do it again. 1.44. So obviously, I got the 1.44 reading on this tiny magnet. And I also got the one maximum 1.44 reading on the giant neodymium magnet. Okay, so... As I said before, these are all N42, N42. All my magnets that I tested so far were N42. So I'm gonna do a slightly different experiment here. Um, this is with uh, the cylinder magnet from before, one inch in diameter by one inch tall. Okay, and I'm going to, um, so that's the south pole. I'm gonna do my measurement. Okay, I get 1.43. So this is basically the same experiment I did before. It's actually the same video I showed you before, but I just want to compare, I'm going to compare the one point, sorry, the N42 to an N52 Gauss of the exact same size. So here I'm going down, I'm trying to find the zero on the N42 ma um, magnet. And Hopefully I do find it in this video. Three, two, one, zero. So I got the zero. And then I go back to get the 1.44 reading, which happens in, it's very, you have to get the Hall sensor very close. So I'm going away from the magnet, going back. You have to get it very close to the um, surface. There I got the 1.44 reading. And so that's what I'm trying to get on. I'm trying to get the maximum reading, which is right at the surface of the magnet um, on all the magnets that I've tested so far. So now I've got my N52 Gauss. It's exactly the same size as the N42 one, um, it's, but it's N52. And so here I'm gonna do the same thing with this one, South Pole. Three clicks to the left. And there's my Hall sensor. There's the 1.43. Having a bit of a hard time finding the 1.44. So I'm gonna do the experiment where I go down the side and I look for the zero point. These are the dielectric plane. So there's positive, somewhere between positive and negative voltage. So now it's in the positive voltage range, zero, one. Ooh, I saw zero. But now I'm in the, let's see, I can't tell. I think I'm in the negative range now. I'm hovering, oh, I saw zero again. I'm trying to find it and I really want to hold it there to prove that I can make a zero, zero reading. Gotta go really slow. Zero. So I found the zero point. That's the dielectric inertia line. I'm gonna come back up, and I'm gonna. There's the 1.44 reading. So now I've got the 1.44 reading. I'm way really close to the surface of the magnet, and I get the 1.44 reading. So that's with an N52 Gauss. Now I thought a magnet with a stronger, you know, number, a bigger number, N52 is a stronger magnet, it can pick up, has more 
lift to it, I really thought that it would show me a different voltage reading on the surface of a magnet of the same size, but as an N42 Gauss um, magnet, N42, N52, they read exactly the same on the surface. And so that was, so aside from the fact that every single magnet I measured, measured 140, 1.44 volts on the surface, even the teeny weeny one, and then the N42 and the N52 read the same. They're the same size. So this seems to me that the N52 and the N42, um, and all the small magnets read the same on the surface. And this is was really exciting for me because this is the property of self-similarity, okay? So the, the magnets all behave the same, at least in terms of these kinds of measurements, um, no matter, so they only really depend on the size of the magnet. It only really depends on the size of the magnet, okay? So, um, and actually, it doesn't depend on the size of the magnet. I can get the same measurement, and this is where the fractal paradigm comes in. I can get the same measurement on every magnet, no matter what size it is. But when the N reading changes, N42, N52, it still reads the same. So the size of the magnet determines the throw of the magnet, right? So, so um, Ken Wheeler alluded to in some of his videos, he basically, he was implying that a stronger magnet of the same size would have a different throw. And it, in my experiments show that that is not true. At least it doesn't have the voltage reading I'm reading at a distance is that seems to be the same, or at least at the surface. So I'm going to do another experiment to verify this. Instead of reading a, a voltage reading on the surface, I'm going to read a voltage reading on um, away from the magnet. And so let's just run this experiment. Okay, so this is the N42 Gauss magnet. It's the south pole that it's facing up. And it three clicks to the left. I've got my Gauss meter. I'm reading 1.38, 1.39 on this edge here, it's, it's not in the center, so it's not the highest reading, but then I'm moving back to a certain point where what I'm looking for is the transition from 0.04 to 0.03. So I'm gonna run that again. Okay, so now it's the south pole, and I turn on my Gauss meter to the proper setting, or the voltmeter and I place this on the surface and I get a 1.39 reading, which is what it's reading at that point right there. I'm moving this, I'm wait, I want to wait until this value here changes to exactly 0.3, and what I did was I marked that point. And I'm gonna do the same thing coming from the other end. So I'm coming from the bottom towards the magnet, and as soon as it turns to 0.3, I stop. And that is the same point coming this way and coming this way. Um, and so this is a very robust point. This point is the point of 0.03 volt reading with, um, with this Hall sensor. Okay, so now I place the, I replace the N42 and put the N52 um, magnet there. And I'm gonna do the same experiment. Three clicks to the left, I touch it to the magnet, I get the 1.38, 1.39 reading. Okay, so everything looks the same on the surface, and then I'm moving towards my point here, and as soon as I get to my dot, it changes to 0.03. So that is the transition from 0.04 to 0.03. And now I'm gonna come from the other side, from this side here, go towards the magnet, and now I'm looking for the transition from 0.02 to 0.03, and right at the same point, right at the same point, I, uh, it does the transition. And so it, this is the same point, this is the same point that I picked for the N42 Gauss 
Okay, and I put both, I put the magnets in exactly the same spot. In fact, I drew a little circle with a pencil to make sure I could accurately place this back on this spot um, so that I, you know, so that the results, you know, can be valid. And so the N52 Gauss and the N42 Gauss show a, an 0.03 volt reading at the same point, at the same point. And so this was also very surprising to me. So not only do all the magnets I have read the same voltage reading at the surface, 1.44 volts, um, the N42 magnet and the N52 magnet um, read, the, read the same, 1.44 volts at the surface, but they also read 0.03 volts at the same distance from the magnet in the same, you know, in the same setup with no changes. So, um, did I get ripped off? Maybe they sent me, you know, two N42 magnets, um, and then just didn't tell me, they just labeled them one N42 and N52. And, um, you know, what would I know? But, so what I did was I took the two magnets and I put them under the ferro cell and took it and tried to keep, keep all the, uh, you know, the settings the same, the lighting the same, um, the position the same. And so I put the N42 magnet under the ferro cell and took a picture with a tripod so the camera was always in the same position. And then I took the N52 Gauss magnet and put it under the ferro cell and what do I see? I see a much stronger um, black spot. I see a much stronger, uh, let's call it dielectric signal, let's call it the zero point, let's call it counter space. Counter space seems bigger, stronger, more powerful, higher capacitance. And so this was the only way. I tried a whole bunch of experiments to, to, to see whether you know, whether I got ripped off. Did they send me two N42s when I asked for an M42 and M52? And only under the ferro cell was I able to tell, oh yes, that is a stronger magnet than this magnet, okay? So, and so this got me to thinking, this is just a little aside, but because of the fractal paradigm, basically I'm saying all magnets are the same except it, the stronger magnet has a darker signal in the um, the dielectric. So basically the dielectric is very, very strong. And so in a stronger magnet. And so uh, this got me to thinking about, um, let's do an alpha blend here on this. And uh, of course this got me back to thinking about that beautiful picture of the quote unquote black hole that they took the plasma sphere or the torus or whatever you want to call it, it doesn't matter, whatever that is, right, is very similar to what we're seeing under the ferro cell, which I always thought. Uh, but this is the fractal paradigm because what this is telling me is that this giant black hole is really just a giant magnet at that scale because magnets have the property of self-similarity. And so the laws of physics regarding magnets, whatever the laws of physics are surrounding magnets, is scalable, is scalable. And this is what I was looking for in terms of magnetism. Uh, when I started out, all I had was this. Oh, if you break a magnet, you get two magnets. If you break them, you get four magnets. And now I have this. Okay, now I have this beautiful picture, this pressure gradient, which makes it all clear to me now makes it all clear to me now. Here's what we have. Here's what we have. Okay, so um, I'm gonna change that to a three, just because that's the line we're looking for. And so what I found with every single magnet that I measured, the big one, the medium one, the small one, the smaller one, and the itty bitty one, the surface of the magnet always measured 1.44 volts, 1.44 volts. 
And so what that means, and what I also, I did some other testing, which I didn't show you, but what also seems to be true is that every magnet, so let's say this line here, this isopotential line, which is just a mathematical uh, extrapolation of the, um, the voltage measurements around the magnet, these are all the same voltage measurement along here. Okay, so if this is 0.03 volts, and I just made that up, it's, this is like somewhere between zero and 0.06 volts, depend, you know, depending on the, the, I don't actually know which this is. It seems to actually be closer to, I'm gonna say 0.1. So I did a little calibration and, and found that if I had a sphere magnet of one, you know, one inch diameter, that this isopotential line should measure 0.01 volts using the Hall sensor that I have. And this, this is kind of true. So I was measuring 0.06 before, okay, which is very close to 0.1. So it's somewhere in here and, and the setup I have isn't super accurate, but I'm gonna say 0.1 just cause that's easy to remember. So a magnet of this size this is still going to read 0.1 volts and a magnet of this size this line is still going to read 0.1 volts and a magnet of this size right 0.1 volt so this is the fractal paradigm right here without this pressure gradient um, picture without this image without this mathematical field without this diagram uh, it's very difficult to see the fractal nature of, of magnetism and magnets Okay, it's very easy to see in this diagram and with the experiments that I just showed you. Okay, this is 1.44 volts on the surface and 0.1 volts out here. Okay, 1.44 volts on the surface, 0.1 volts here, etc., etc., etc. And so the experiments I showed you with the tiny magnets, with the tiny magnets, was similar to taking one of these smaller guys and placing them right here on an isopotential line, right? So when you place a magnet down near a big magnet, when you take, place a small magnet near a big magnet, okay, they communicate with each other. They This lines up to this, so the blue is pointing to the red. This is going to line up to this, and it's going to depending on the forces, depending on how big this magnet is, depending on, in my experiment, I had gravity pushing down and I had friction in the paper. So all those forces have to be taken into consideration. But um, I could place a magnet right here. And when I pushed it, it wanted to roll along the isopotential line to the magnet and then it would fly to the magnet. So, um, so I think the reason that happens now, most of the, the magnetic experiments, you know, you learn about with when you're a kid, you take two magnets that are the same size, you bring them together, they attract or they repel. But if you have a big magnet and a small magnet, you can see how nicely this small magnet fits into this um, scenario right here and um, could sit nicely there without too much trouble because this... The gradient, the pressure gradient, this is a low pressure gradient in here. You can tell because the lines are far apart. When the lines are far apart, the, the slope is low, the gradient is small, whatever you want to call it. And when the lines are closer together, that means the slope is high, the pressure is high. Whatever it is you're modeling with these lines, um, this has a, a greater force, let's say, than this. So when this is a small magnet, can sit near a big magnet without falling in, or it's going to follow, if you set it into motion, it's gonna follow the potential line instead of falling straight to the magnet. And I have lots of experiments that demonstrate that, which I will be doing in some other videos. And so the one other thing I want to point out here in terms of the fractal paradigm is in these diagrams that I've been generating with uh, Mike's, Michael Sh uh, Snyder's uh, pick to mag software. He generates these little lines as well, and these are really just compass needles 
he models them as compass needles. If you placed a compass needle here, it would orient itself in this, in this manner. And so, but what I want to point out here, and this is just a clue, this is just a hint, this is just a, um, this is what I've been getting at all along is that the ether, space, whatever you want to call it, the vacuum is filled with, is made of, contains, is composed of um, these tiny little pressure gradients. And so what I learned from the fractal paradigm, what, it, what I learned from the fractal paradigm, and actually what I learned from the Mendelbrot set, what I learned from the Mendelbrot set is that pressure gradients, pressure gradients are scalable. The Mendelbrot set itself is actually a pressure gradient or can be thought of as a pressure gradient. As you can see, as I'm zooming into the Mendelbrot set, I'm generating higher order, um, higher order gradients, which is analogous to creating um, field pressure gradients. And so this is a gradient, as you can see, as I zoom in, as I zoom in, what's happening is I'm getting to smaller and smaller scales, but as I get to smaller and smaller scales, I can see the gradient. Okay, I can see a gradient being formed. So pressure gradients are scalable in the fractal sense. You can have a small scale pressure gradient. You can have a small scale pressure gradient. You can have a medium scale pressure gradient and you can have a large scale pressure gradient and small scale pressure gradients can coexist with, sit inside of um, large scale pressure gradients. And so the experiment I did with the sphere magnet and the tiny, um, tiny blue magnets, the blue magnets were three millimeters in diameter. And so the mass ratio, the volume ratio and the mass ratio of these two objects was around, um, you know, 600, almost 700 to one. So, but the, the mass ratio between uh, an electron and a proton is, uh, I think it's 1836 to one. And so, um, so all I would have to do, I believe is reduce the diameter of my tiny magnet in that experiment to two millimeters instead of three millimeters. And I would end up with an approx approximately the same mass ratio between the proton and an electron, okay? These are electron orbitals. Okay? These are electron orbitals, okay? So, um, and that, is the fractal paradigm. So in the fractal paradigm, this is scalable. This is scalable to different scales. And these can co coexist with these. And that's why like this would be a an atom with an electron in an orbital somewhere around the magnet. Now, this gets me to thinking about what is an electron doing around a magnet? Is it really orbiting? Or has it just uh, mediated its pressures so if, if an electron is found here, it will mediate the pressure. It's mediated the pressures with this big object here. And so it can nicely, peacefully sit there, or maybe it can sit here. And if it gets in too close, of course, it's gonna spiral in, but then there's something else keeping it away. So there's a lot, this doesn't tell the whole story. This doesn't hold, tell the whole story, but this isopotential gradient Oh, this is what I know. It's a scalable object with very specific boundary conditions. Of course, these are surfaces. These are not um, lines. These are surfaces. And I can show you quickly what that looks like. Okay, so the isopotential surface looks like this. And actually, there's there should be a space between these two. This is my first attempt at 
um, making a 3D model of the isopotential surfaces, um, which you can see right here. And so the, that's why, you know, they're not lines, they're surfaces. This whole surface has the same potential, has, would read the same voltage in every point. So this would be a positive voltage, this would read negative voltage. And uh, I think I'm going to leave it at that. This is the fractal paradigm in a nutshell. There's no difference between um, this at this scale and this at this scale, right? Each surface measures 1.44 volts. This surface here measures 0.1 volts um, and so on down, right? Um, have a good one.